Let's take our Bibles and look once again in John chapter 1. And I want us to read from verse 47 down to verse 51 and speak with you about the Son of God and the Son of Man. People wonder, they say, well, which is he? And the answer is both. That's how he is revealed here in the scriptures. There are many that just see him as a man and consider that he came in order to give us an example of how to live. But the scriptures declare him to be the God-man. and He didn't come just to give sinners an example of how to live. Because even if he had done that, there's none that could follow his example. We're sinners. He was holy, just, without sin. He came in order to be the substitute for those sinners that God the Father gave him. And so you can see already the seriousness of this subject concerning Christ as the Son of God and Son of Man. This is just not for information. But as needy sinners, as Job said, I need an umpire. I need somebody that can put his hand on God and put his hand on me. Just to fill the breach, the gap that there is because of our sin and separation with God. For Christ is that man. He's the God man. And so we want to see who he is as the son of God. Those are the two titles that are revealed here in my text. Remember when John the Baptist was declaring him as the Lamb of God. That was his message. And we saw the significance of that taken from Genesis chapter 22. When Abraham told his son Isaac, going up on Mount Moriah, which is where the Lord later built the temple. It was right there on Mount Moriah. And when Isaac asked, I see the wood, I see the fire, where's the lamb? Abraham, again, he wasn't speaking this just by his own intellect. The spirit of Christ being in him declared unto Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. We looked at the three ways that that could be understood. It's God himself providing the lamb. So he's called the Lamb of God. And that God will provide himself a lamb, that that lamb to be slain, that was without blemish and without spot, was for God. It was unto God. God will provide himself that lamb. Those lambs of the Old Testament could not put away sin. It was a covering. The word used in scriptures is an atonement. But sin wasn't put away until God had provided himself that lamb that he had ordained should be to his satisfaction. But the third thing we saw with regard to that declaration, again, that the spirit of Christ put within Abraham is that God would himself be that lamb. He would provide himself that lamb that he himself would be that lamb. And that's what we're seeing here in these scriptures. One of the key terms of this apostle John, as you read through here, you can take your concordance and look it up, how many times he uses the Son of God, the Son of God, the Son of God. Even with John the Baptist, when he declared that he was the voice to declare the lamb, behold, the lamb of God, he says there in verse 34 concerning Christ's baptism when he came up out of the water and God caused that voice to be, his voice to be heard from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Look at the record that he bare. Remember we looked last time at what it means to bear that record. That's like standing in court, testify. He said, I saw and bear record that this is the son of God. None other than the son of God. And so, here in my text, we have those two expressions used down in verse 49, when the Lord is pleased to reveal himself to Nathanael. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. 
thou art the king of Israel. And then you notice here our Lord himself quoting from the very passage that we just heard read in Genesis chapter 28 concerning Jacob and the revelation of Christ to Jacob. I know people call that Jacob's ladder. It's God's ladder. It's just like people who quote the Lord's Prayer. Well, that was the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17, where he prayed on behalf of those that the Father had given him. And the Lord willing, we'll come back to John 1 and verse 51 in the next message, should the Lord be pleased to see us through another week and see what was revealed unto Jacob as he would, was sent by Isaac, his father, to find a, a bride for himself, with all the blessings that was there that the Lord met him. And that was a revelation of Christ. We know that specifically even here because Christ said, he saith unto Nathanael, and he's quoting from Genesis 28, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So here he's revealed as the Son of God, declared to be Son of God, but the Lord saying he's also that Son of Man. And that ladder there in Genesis 28, which was set upon earth, it's interesting how that's put, is exactly how it is that Christ came to this earth with the top of the ladder being in heaven, and that's where it began. You shall see heaven open. This is the revelation of Christ on earth. It was necessary that he come as a man. So he's both the son of God and the son of man. And that twofold revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's illustrated there in what I would call God's ladder. Not Jacob's. He didn't build it. It wasn't set up by him. This was God. And even so, Christ in the flesh, he's described as that tabernacle that is not made with hands, wherein the fullness of the Godhead dwelt. So let's not just take lightly these terms concerning Christ. I believe this is how the Lord is revealed in the hearts of those he came to save, both the Son of God and the Son of Man. Let's read here. And from verse 47, because this is where we left off last time. Jesus saw Nathanael. And remember, the Lord is drawing each one of these to himself by his spirit, through the word of these that he had already been revealed in. And so we saw how Philip went and found Nathanael there in verse 45. and said, we have found him. Mentioned last time, that's how you know that a person has had their heart opened by the Spirit of God. They're talking about Him. They're talking about Christ, not their experience, but Christ. We found Him, and not just Him, but Him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. The people today that testify of having found Jesus. And yet, when you hear them describe him, it's not in accord with the scriptures. It's in accord with how they've been taught by a man and reassured by a man that if they have just said this prayer and meant it sincerely, that now they can be sure that they found Jesus. And yet, the Jesus that they declare in no way resembles this one of the scriptures. Notice he said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. That's how the Old Testament was described back in the day. We have what we call Old Testament, New Testament, but it's the law of Moses, which is the first five books, and then all the rest were the prophets. Even David was called a prophet. Well, what was their message? Clearly, Philip was taught of the Lord by his spirit. He was one, I, I don't know if, if these had individual copies of the scriptures or whether this was in going to the synagogues and hearing them read, but 
These were ones clearly taught of the Spirit of God through the Scriptures, awaiting this one who should come. And now, what Philip is declaring is he is come. And he declares him Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, when you look back in Scripture, that lineage from which Christ should come, the Christ should come, he was of that lineage of, of Joseph. He was of the house of David. That's why they needed to go to Bethlehem to be taxed. And the Lord purposed that they leave Nazareth and come to Bethlehem for the census of the day and all that, Mary was with child. Did that just happen? Is the Lord directing even that in the fulfillment of the scriptures concerning this one who should come? That's quite a declaration, isn't it, in verse 45? That if God has been pleased to teach us of Christ, he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and Son of Man is revealed in the Scripture. Now initially, Nathaniel, verse 46, asks this question, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? This is like some little podunk village without any kind of reputation, but it fits exactly how Isaiah declared that the Lord Jesus should come, like, like a little plant growing up, tender plant growing up out of the wilderness. And that there wasn't any beauty in him for which to behold and say, ah, there, there's the Son of God. I don't believe he was saying it necessarily in a critical way, but more out of surprise that this one, Jesus of Nazareth, should be that one of whom the scriptures spoke. I find it interesting that what Philip declared to be the truth, Jesus of Nazareth, over time became a term of derision. Remember when they called Peter before the Sanhedrin and asked him in Acts by whose name that that man, that lame man that had sat in front of their temple all those years and had not, they had not been able to do one thing for him and now suddenly he's up and jumping and rejoicing. By what name, Peter, the Sanhedrin were 70 uh, that sat on this council, a religious council back in the day of Jews, made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. They didn't even get along. But when it came to condemning this Jesus of Nazareth, a name of derision for them, they were united. Now, Peter could have said, well, it's, it was in the name of Jehovah God, and he would have been right. But he would have been wrong in that that was a name or a term that they could have accepted. But what did Peter declare? That it was by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you have taken and crucified, that this man stands whole before you. So what was a term of derision? And I dare say we've got to be specific today with people in our generation. Because they're following a Jesus, but Paul even warned the Corinthians, beware of those that come to you preaching another gospel, or another Jesus, or another spirit. They go to these crusades and people falling out and swooning, and people say, well, that's the spirit of God. It's a spirit, but it's another spirit. Because the spirit of God, when he's pleased to work in a people, in the hearts of a people, it's exactly as what we see here. The declaration is going to be of Christ. The message is going to be of Christ, and it's going to be according to the Scriptures. And don't we also marvel the more the Lord is pleased to teach us of Christ and to study his beginnings and humility, being born of a, in a family, put in a family of a carpenter, the scriptures say that when he would come, he would come into the lowest parts of the earth. That, that's speaking of his humble beginning, born in a manger, and yet being none other than the Son of God and the Son of Man. So that's what Philip said, come and see. And I would encourage all of us as the Lord 
directs us to speak to people that we know are in false religion and not hearing of the Christ. Encourage them to come and see where we meet. Come and hear of this one. Come without programs and fanfare and productions and all that. Come and see. If the Lord be pleased to give you eyes to see. Now, that's how the Lord already was at work. We know that in the following testimony concerning Nathaniel, because he would not have come had it not been that the Spirit of Christ was already drawing him. And so verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel <clears throat> coming to him. That's an important statement right there of any that have been drawn to Christ. He saw us first. In fact, from all eternity, he saw Nathaniel, he saw, he saw his seed. He knew every one that the Father had given him. And so even as he was coming, as to whom coming, we do come to Christ, and yet it's not by our own will, it's not by our own intelligence, it's not by our own reasoning, but it's the Spirit of Christ that draws us, else we would never come to this Christ. And so, how blessed is that statement? Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no God. And Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee. But he was even in that calling by Philip, through the voice of Philip. Before Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now people went out under the fig tree to meditate. And just like the Ethiopian eunuch, when the Lord brought Philip to him, he was already reading the scriptures. And the Lord had already prepared him. I can't say this with definitiveness, but it seems to fit the context that he may well have been sitting under that tree meditating the very scripture that the Lord himself quoted down in verse 51. It's like with Simeon, when he saw the Lord come to the temple and he said, now I can die because mine eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. How was he <clears throat> anticipating even that this little babe in the arms would be that one who was the hope of Israel? Well, it's through the scriptures. And that's why the Lord was saying to him that in being under that fig tree, I saw thee. He was already directing his heart and meditating upon the word. And the Lord now by his spirit drawing him. And Nathanael answered and saith unto him. See, this is the evidence of the work of the spirit in the heart because it's not a matter of him saying, well, come sit down over here, thou Jesus of Nazareth, and explain to me some things. His heart was already tendered and enlivened by the very grace of God, so that when Christ revealed himself here to Nathaniel, you'll see his answer in verse 49, Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, that word means master, teacher, Thou art the Son of God, and thou art the King of Israel. Is there any way that somebody can say that Christ has been revealed in them and bypass who he is in all his truth? Absolutely not. Thou art the Son of God, and notice, thou art the King of Israel. How was he even able to declare that? Well, again, the Spirit of Christ in him, but through the Scriptures. Exactly as Philip had said, come see the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did right. Jesus of Nazareth, there he is as the Son of Man, but none less than the Son of God, King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I 
said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Believest thou? There weren't any punctuation marks in the original. And I know this is posed as a question that somehow now he was believing because he had seen. But if you take the question mark out, the Lord is saying to him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, thou believest. That's the only way we can believe is the Lord having seen us and revealed himself in us as sinners. But then he goes on to say, thou shalt see greater things than these. This is the beginning of that revelation of Christ. And any of us in whom Christ has been revealed, we can think back to that moment, that time when it pleased God to reveal Christ in us and how glorious it was. But then again, since that time, how much more he's been pleased to teach us of himself. That's really what Christ is saying here to Nathaniel. This is not the end of the road, Nathaniel. This is the beginning. That you should believe. Why? Because it was the Lord who saw him. It was the Lord who drew him. And so in believing, thou shalt see greater things than these. In other words, that Christ would be all the more confirmed to his heart that yes, this is that one. Even in the face of all of the opposition and affliction that he would face as one of the Lord's. And even death, because remember, each one of these disciples laid down their lives. That's what the word martyr means. So that's what, what the word witness means in Scripture. It's a martyr. But so firm and so great would be that foundation of faith that nothing could move. Greater things than need, you'll see. And that's when he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Right there it shows us that that vision that Jacob had back there in Genesis 28, that ladder was Christ. The angels descending, ascending, descending upon him, upon that ladder, is a revelation of him being God, whom the angels serve. When Isaiah saw that vision of Christ there in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw the Lord of glory. And the angels surrounding the throne, declaring, holy, holy, holy is thy name. There's so much there in that verse that I want to come back to it next time. And so, first thing we know here in this particular text is that Christ as the Son of God and Christ as the Son of Man is revealed to Nathaniel. That's how it was that the Lord could see Nathaniel coming to him even before Nathaniel knew anything of the Lord. It's because he's God. He knows those that are his. And Nathaniel was just about to find out about it. That's the way it is with any of us. That when it pleased God to reveal Christ in us, it's then that we found out about him, but that it wasn't our finding out about him that was the foundation of our faith. It's in this one whom it pleased God to reveal in us. And when it says there, behold an Israelite indeed, each one of these statements is so important and vital because there were many Israelites. But Christ did not come for all that were Jews. When it says here, behold an Israelite indeed, he's saying of him, you are a true son of Israel. Again, that's the name that was given to Isaac. But it's also the name that pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The word means a prince with God. That's who Christ is, the prince of life. And so, behold an Israelite indeed. Behold a true son of Jacob. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And yet, 
not even all those that were physical sons of Jacob were true sons of Israel. Paul makes that plain over in Romans chapter 9 in verses 6 and 7. If you look there with me, Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. He speaks there of, of those that were the fathers whom according to the, the flesh through whom Christ came. That's the reason why God preserved that seed of Jacob. And it says, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. So he was of the seed of Isaac and Jacob on down through. But who is he? So that's who he is as the son of man. But it says who is over all, God blessed forever. When it says God bless forever, that's not like we say to people, well, God bless you. It's declaring that this one who came from this seed was none other than God himself, who is blessed forever. Amen. So be it. That's what that word means. Now, people will say, but there were an awful lot of Israel that perished. And so all anticipating the objection says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Notice, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So here Christ is distinguishing Nathaniel out from the rest of Israel. Even as any that God has chosen are distinguished out from everybody else around him. He says, neither because they are seed, the seed of Abraham. See, Israel, the Jews, that's what they claim. Well, we be of Abraham, our father. And the Lord said to them, if you were, then you would believe me. He's talking about the true seed of Abraham, the spiritual Israel. He said, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, verse 8, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. There's people today still looking at Natural Israel, national Israel, and say, well, that's God's chosen people. They were only chosen as a type and a picture of God's true Israel, which is Christ. And that seed that God the Father had given to his son in him. Those are the true children of the promise that are counted for the seed. And so here in John chapter 1 and verse 47, we read over this Real quickly, don't we? Behold, a, an Israelite indeed. But what does that mean? And then the second part, it says, in whom is no God. As I've often said to you, there's enough in Scripture to ensnare anybody that reads it blindly. Because people will look at that and say, ah, in whom is no God. That, that's why the Lord saw him. That's why the Lord drew him, because he was really a good fellow. And that's how often this is preached up here, that there was no guile in him. I'll tell you this, there's nothing in any sinner that Christ has come to save or drawn to himself that can say that they are without sin. That's how some read this. In whom was no guile. Well, Paul declared it that if righteousness come by law, the law, or any personal obedience to the law, Christ is dead in vain. He immediately set Christ aside. And so we know that that's not what Christ was saying of Nathaniel here, that he was somehow without sin. There's only been one without sin, and that is Christ himself, God in the flesh. Because as the Lamb of God, the one who would offer himself up to his Father, he had to be without sin, without blemish. This is was typified there in the Old Testament lambs. But I believe when he says here of Nathaniel, it's the same thing that can be said of any that the Lord has come to save and has saved, that in them is no God. In other words, by the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord was looking on him as one for whom he would pay the debt. And you notice here, even in Nathaniel's answer, that 
that he asked that question, whence knowest thou me? He wasn't speaking there like, oh yeah, that's me, all right. But still marveling, as any do, that the Lord is pleased to draw to himself, why me? How is it that you, being the Son of God, being the King of Israel, that you should even address a word to me? You ever think about that? The, if the testimony of God is that in us is no guile, I will tell you right now, any tall of spirit are never going to take any any kind of credit for themselves. They're gonna they're gonna wonder. How is it how how could it be? Whence knowest thou me? And so I believe even here the Lord was speaking to Nathaniel in a in a way that he would reveal to Nathaniel. Nathaniel would be there when they came to take our Lord and would uh, crucify him. He would see the, the crucified Lamb of God and know that that's the only way that it could be said of him or anybody else for whom Christ paid the death. That it would be <clears throat> that righteousness that he earned and established that would be put to their account. And it would be that blood shed on their behalf that it could be said that they are without guile. And so that's why Nathaniel, when he declares here, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. He's bound in worship. It doesn't necessarily mean that he bowed physically, but in his heart, the Lord brought him to bow and acknowledge him for who he is. I hear all of these people talking about their experience with Jesus. And, you know, they're giddy about it. whoop de doo That's not anybody that has been taught of the Spirit of God. The Lord has ever taught you. And even John here, that wrote, the Lord used to write this epistle in Revelation. When he had a view of Christ from heaven and ascended in glory, it says he fell at his feet as it were as dead. Speechless. And I... See, even here with regard to Nathaniel, this wasn't any kind of giddy declaration. This was out of the heart the mouth speaks. This was as Christ was being revealed in him that he declares rabbi. He doesn't say you may be the son of God. I can see now how you could be. He said thou art the son of God. This is the same response that the Lord drew out of Peter. When he asked, who do men say that I am? And they talked about different men's opinions. There's, there's every kind of opinion you can imagine about who, who Christ is. But it was so in his day. Some say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say that you're Elias, Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And you remember when Christ said, but who do you say that I am? Remember Peter's declaration? <laughs> Just like here, thou art the Christ, the Son. There's that same term, the Son of the living God. Very definite. You remember what the Lord said to them? He said to Peter, Peter, flesh and blood haven't revealed this. You didn't come up with this of your own reasoning. But my Father, which is in heaven, hath revealed it unto that's the testimony of any one of us. That's what I listen for when I hear other people talking of Christ. That they're going to declare him for who he is, not just the, a man who came to live an example with, with his life and now we're to follow him, but none other than the Son of God, and notice, the King of Israel. Remember, that's what the Jews disputed with when Pilate hung that placard over Christ's head as he hung on the cross. He put, this is the king of the Jews. And you remember, they want to go back and have him change it and say, well, he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. That's amazing. An unconverted man. But he's the crucified and were also blind. Couldn't see. But that's who he is. None other than the Son of God, which means the King. You have people running around today that have never been taught.
taught had never seen by the Spirit of God, Christ's sovereignty. In fact, that's that's another evidence that they've never been taught of Christ because they balk against the truth as it is in Christ that the Father has given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father has given him. It's his prerogative to save and it's his prerogative to condemn. In one sense, we think, well, he could have just walked right on past Nathaniel, and he would have been just in doing so. But on the other hand, we know that he could not just have walked by Nathaniel. Because this was one of those for whom he came. Read the Gospels from that perspective. Why would Christ cross an entire sea? in order to deliver one man like he did with a demoniac of the gatherings and then get in his boat and leave. Yes, but aren't, aren't there others there? That was why he came. It's like the Samaritan woman. There were many ways to get to Jerusalem. There was a path down the other side of the Jordan River. That's where the Jews walked because they would not walk through Samaria. Such was the enmity. And yet you read in John 4, it was necessary. I must go through Samaria. Even the disciples were startled and amazed that he would sit on that well and be talking to a woman. And yet it was for her he came. It's like blind Bartimaeus. The Lord passed by. There were other blind people. But as he cried out, you say, well, who gave him the cry? was the Lord. This very one who is the Son of God, the King of Israel, coming to save his Israel, that seed that the Father gave him. That cry of blind Bartimaeus stopped our Lord in his tracks. The Roman army couldn't stop him. But here's a cry of a beggar, blind man. Think of Zacchaeus. This day is salvation coming to thy house. And stop and think about yourself if you're the Lord. Why me? Why me? Who am I that he should even consider who I am? And when it pleases God to reveal Christ in any one of us, we marvel, we bow, we declare. And there's no question it's who does the saving, sovereign Lord God, for whom he came. And that's where the Lord tells him. In tenderness, in verse 50, he answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Wherever we were, when it pleased God to reveal Christ in us, it's him that saw us. It's him that found us. I can remember it well. I was done with all my education, higher learning, theology, and all of that. Out there just... But I thought serving the Lord. I was going to be a pioneer missionary. Built on no other man's foundation. Sitting out there in the middle of the jungle in Africa. With a kerosene lamp. Because we didn't have electricity. Sitting like that. It's hot. My, my sweat on my arms would stick to papers. It was so hot. And I remember the Lord turning my heart to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year these eyes died, I saw the Lord. I lifted up. You read in John 12, that was, he saw Christ. And that's how the Lord opened my heart. He found me there where I was, reading the scriptures that I've read for years, never had seen Christ. Well, I'll tell you, when the Lord's pleased to reveal himself in that way, you're never the same. I remember going back and just wondering. How it is I could read this word? He missed Christ. But the good news, he didn't leave it there. That's why I say he couldn't just walk by. He wouldn't. I have people ask that. How do you know you're the Lord? What has he taught you of himself? When you open this word, do you see him, even if it is just in a seed form? Just like with Nathaniel. You'll not stay there. That's what the Lord told 
Nathaniel there in verse 50. I saw the other victory. I saw you in your thoughts. I saw you in, in all that you were pondering. Why? Because he was the one directing his thoughts. That you should believe. But you'll see greater things than these. He's talking about greater things than these. How much greater can there be than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work? But what he's talking about there is that as he continued to be taught of Christ and would follow Christ, and the Lord would be pleased to reveal himself even more in him. A lot of people say, well, they didn't see the miracles and other things. Those all confirm who Christ was, but I believe here is talking about the inner working of the Spirit. That what I know today of Christ is far greater than what I ever knew when I when he first caused me to believe. And I thank him for that. How the Lord, people mention the raising of the dead, and the casting out of devils, and healing of all manner of diseases. But here, I believe, more significantly, the Lord is speaking of those things which would do nothing but strengthen that faith in the thing, even as that faith is strengthened in anyone that the Lord came to save and did save. He's speaking here of his death. Greater things, what's, what's greater? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. His burial, his resurrection, his ascension on high, greater things than these shalt thou see. Nathaniel, why? Because I came to save you. You the sinner who you are. And then that's where we see the confirmation there in verse 51, which we'll come back to next time. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. The Lord willing, we'll take that up next time. All right.